Now in the last two episodes in my podcast series entitled, Shani, girl, I hope you have a prenup. I uncovered gut-wrenching details surrounding Pastor Keon's relationship with his father, the late Reverend Dr. Cato Brooks Jr., pastor of Tree of Light Missionary Baptist Church in Gary, Indiana, who was not introduced into Pastor Keon's life as his father until he was 12 years old. And as you know, I am convinced that the reason that Pastor Keon, a 42-year-old man, has divorced two women and is now with his third wife, the second First Lady of Lighthouse Church, Lady Shani, is directly linked to the pain and hurt that results from his tumultuous relationship with his late father that literally brings him to his knees. He's using the agony to bless you. <laughs> oh! Uh-huh. He's feeling you. Uh-huh. Let it out. Let it out. Let it out. Don't be no tough guy. Let it out. 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 Uh-huh. Like that. Let it out. Let it. Let it out like that. Let it out like that. Let it out. Let it out. Let it out like that. Let it out. Let it out. Let it out like that. That's the spot where your water turns to wine. When you let it out. When you let it out. When you let it out, let go of your cute stuff and let it out. Now, as a result of questions from my last two episodes in this podcast mini-series that related to how Pastor Keon's mother factors into this saga, I am coming back to you today with answers to those questions answered directly by Pastor Keon's mother herself. And I'm realizing that's when I was conceived. That's about the time that God brought me in the earth. When you found out that you were pregnant with me, can you take me back to that moment? Like, what were you thinking? Uh, where were you at in life? It was a little awkward, okay. you know, but uh, yet a, a happiness, you know. Yeah. Hi there, I am Professor Blackmore, and I wanna welcome you back to my channel, and I wanna welcome you back to part C in this podcast mini-series entitled, Why Shani Will Be Pastor Keon's Ex-First Lady Number Two and Ex-Wife Number Three, wherein I have struggled to analyze why I think some of the devastating events that took place early in Pastor Keon's life will dictate whether his relationship with Lady Shani will be able to overcome those obstacles, which also dovetails into analyzing the question of whether Pastor Keon will ever be satisfied with any woman and how his mother factors into this analysis. And so, let's go back to the very beginning of Pastor Keon's life. So, I'm born July 6th, 1981. When I think about that, I back up and then I say, you must have conceived me around October of 1980. And I couldn't figure this out until I start thinking about talking to you today. Why does something happen to me every October in my life? Um, the Lighthouse Church started in October. Um, the first church that I ever started, we organized in October. Um, most recently, um, and, and it's no secret, going through a divorce and those proceedings initiated in October. True. I could go down the list of October, 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 October. Now, I really love how he categorizes the divorce that he filed against his second wife, the first First Lady of Lighthouse Church, Lady Felicia, by saying, quote, those proceedings initiated in October, end quote. But let the truth be told, ladies and gentlemen, of this church house internet jury, Pastor Keon himself, through his attorneys, filed this divorce against Lady Felicia on October the 16th, 2019, in which he identifies himself as the petitioner and his wife, Felicia, as the respondent. And so 
I can't quite understand how he makes it seem as if this thing happened to him out of the blue when he actually brought about the happening of this event. And just two weeks before he filed the divorce, here they are together at the church. He's really showing you what he'll do in your house. And, and I'm excited that most of you all, although it may not be dirt, but get ready to break some sort of ground in your life. Get ready to break some sort of ground in your life. So Mike, are you ready? All right, so this is my hat. Now, I don't know about you, but this does not look like a woman who knew her husband was about to serve her with a divorce petition. And I bet you wouldn't be surprised to know that also in October, just one year prior to this event, specifically on October the 5th, 2018, Pastor Keon had to file this proposed final judgment and permanent restraining order against a woman who was a member of the Lighthouse Church who claimed that she was told by somebody in the blessed name of Jesus that she was going to be the next first lady of Lighthouse Church, which said permanent injunction and restraining order remains in effect until this very day as it relates to Pastor Keon, Lady Felicia, and her children. And it remains in effect until December the 31st, 2026. And so I guess October is his month. And before we get back into Pastor Keon's interview of Mother Henderson, I have to lay the foundation about some of Pastor Keon's father's other children. My oldest brother dies. Um, he dies at 89 pounds. This is his son? His son. Okay. So this is your older brother, brother secretly? Yeah. Who knows that I'm his brother, who lets me spend a night at the house as a 10, 11, 12, 13 year old, treats me. So what God had done is he had given me some tentacles into my family, even though I didn't get to go all the way in there, I had some connections. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I've got my brother who knows that I'm his brother and he, whether actually are just facade would be upset with me mm -hmm. at his house about my father not taking care of me but he would do it so i drove my brother's car to the prom okay, okay. oh wow so i've got i've got these tentacles that i'm connected to and and by the way his name is cato brooks like my father so my father's a junior he's a third looks just like him um he dies i don't know if it hurt me more than it hurt anybody else because my only connection to this larger than life personality. Now, if you have not already watched parts A and B of this podcast mini series, then I highly suggest that you do so. But to be clear, Pastor Keon's father is the pastor of the neighborhood church at this point in time that we're talking about, the Tree of Life Missionary Baptist Church in Gary, Indiana and his father has a wife and children with his wife when pastor keon is born and pastor keon 
already has at least one older stepbrother that is living within the family household of his father's home with his wife. And so now with this backdrop in mind, let's see what else Mother Henderson has to say about the beginning of Pastor Keon's life. When you found out that you were pregnant with me, can you take mm -hmm. me back to that moment? Like, what were you thinking? Uh, where were you at in life? Well, what, I, what was I thinking? <laughs> <laughs> the most blessed what thing that God that? could ever do to you. That's what you can say right now if you're thinking about what you want to say. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was a little awkward, okay. you know, but uh, yet a, a happiness, you know, yeah. and everything. I never, ever, never, the thought never crossed my mind to get rid of you. Mm. You know, and even though in the uh, what was going on, mm -hmm. you know, and everything, and at that point, your your father had already informed me that it, that you was going to be a boy. Mm -hmm. You know that he had been asking for a son, that he wanted a son, and God wow. had promised him a son. You know, and everything. So when I wasn't surprised when um, you was born. As a, as a male, because he always reiterated and, let, and assured me that you was a, a boy, that he was having a son. Now, I'm perplexed by this because just a few minutes ago, Pastor Keon has told us out of his own mouth that he was born on July the 6th, 1981. And he has also told us out of his own mouth just a few minutes after that, that he had an older brother who was his father's namesake that he named after him and the son's headstone reveals that he was born 20 years before Pastor Keon was born. So I'm perplexed by what Pastor Keon's mother is saying in this moment. I mean, why would Pastor Keon's father tell his mother, quote, that he had been asking for a son and that God had promised him a son, end quote. I mean, really? I mean, God promised you a male child from another woman in the same church wherein you're the pastor while you're married to another woman who is the first lady of that same church? So <laughs> that was extremely confusing to me. And I'm really not judging because something is making me think somehow that these people seem to believe that this was of God or something, or that it was biblical in some way. I mean, it kind of seems as if she really thought and or that she was led to believe that she was led by God to carry out these actions. And it seems that she doubled down on carrying out these actions. What was it like? Because you didn't leave that church. Your mother didn't leave that church. Um, your sister didn't leave that church. No, sir. And, and we haven't even talked about that she was also his child. Um, how could you sit there? <laughs> and so, now we have the full family tree. But I think one of the most gut-wrenching things about this story was learning how Pastor Keon, at age 12 or 13, learned for the first time who his father was. You served a pastor as an adjutant, and at 12 years old, you found out that your pastor was your father. Yes, sir. How did you find out? Well, um, there was an event at school, um, and it was a father-son event called Dads and Donuts. And um, went to the event and saw all of the dads there. Mm -hmm. And just decided to go home and ask my mother one day, who is my father? And I went home and I asked her, and she looked at me and she paused. And I know her, I know my mama, mm -hmm. I know her, I know her, I can see her sitting here and she's a hundred miles away, but I know her. And I knew something was wrong. Mm -hmm. And after what seemed to be an hour, which was probably 10 seconds, mm -hmm. she says, Dr. Brooks is your father. All of my siblings are in the room at the time. 
they say nothing, I ran out of the room screaming. Because for every year that I could remember, I used to pray and wish he was my father. Because he was this quintessential example of what a father should be. I saw him taking care of his other children. I saw him building a ministry. I saw him amassing wealth. I saw him building apartments for the less fortunate community development corporations. He was a multi-site church in the 80s. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so wow. I saw this growing up. And the moment I found out, honor became hatred. Now, this was one of the most earth shattering things I think I've ever heard. And he seems to talk about it in such a matter of fact kind of way, almost as if this is how everybody found out who their father was. And after getting more insight from Mother Henderson, I kind of see how and why this came to be. Because again, it almost seems that she thought she was carrying out God's plan. And it seems that while she felt compelled to keep it secret from everybody else in the community, she seemed to think that she could not discuss it with her child. Or maybe she thought that learning the truth would destroy the child. And I had a lot of comments from people telling me that she must have been a teenager, but after hearing more facts from this interview, I really don't think so. So how, how hard was it to be a single parent? You have me, but Kiana's not here yet. And then you have Danielle. And so Kiana and I were a year and a half apart. Mm -hmm. So you conceive her. So just take me like, it's three of us there. Um, you um, have been previously married to my older sister's father. Mm -hmm. Now you're single. And it's just you, me, and the girls. I can still remember, like it was yesterday, we were staying at the house on Maryville. And I remember um, when you were going through the divorce, and I remember seeing two black trash bags leaning up against the wall. And I remember asking you what those were for, for and then you said uh, that our father, stepfather at the time, and this is what I loved about you. I, I never heard you say anything negative about anybody, um, especially our fathers in a day and time where that's just not a common thing uh, with women today. Uh, no child support, no help, no nothing. I still never heard you say anything negative. Left to do it on your own, I still never heard you say anything negative. And when I saw those two bags leaning up against that wall, um, you said, he went on, uh, his job took him on vacation. He had to go work. You never said he left us. You never said uh, he, nothing, you know, and, and I admired you. But that day was the day that I decided in my heart that you were never going to have to work again. I didn't know how I was going to do it. I thought it was going to be basketball. But that's the day the fire came up inside of me because I, I realized later that you didn't tell us the truth. You were trying to protect us from the truth. How hard is that, Mama, when you, when you have to do that and, and, and struggle and not let your kids know what the real deal is to protect them? Take me to that moment and how difficult it was. Well, it's pretty um, difficult to do, and you have to muscle up everything within you to do it. But I was able to do it out of the love for you guys, you guys were my number one priority. I ask God that as long as he bless me with my help and my strength, I will work. Even if I could have took him to court and sued for child support, you know, if I wanted to. But it, it crossed my mind. But every time I thought about it, the Holy Spirit said, no, don't do it. And I, because I had to think of the position, the church, and all that, you know. Sometimes, you know, say when you make decisions, you have to learn to live with them. Whether it's good or ugly, you have to learn to live with them. And things wasn't picture perfect 
you know, and everything. Living condition when I wasn't all that great, you know. But it was a thing. We never were outside. We never went without food. You guys never went without clothing or shoes or anything. And so, Mother Henderson was married to Pastor Keon's older sister's father, but they don't really talk about the identity of the father of his younger sister. Although we've been clued in at this point on who that father is, but they kind of brush past that detail in this interview of Mother Henderson. But what we can glean from this is that she was most likely not some teenage girl. I'm sure she was probably very young, but I get the feeling that she was of age. Notwithstanding the fact that I do believe that she was being groomed in some kind of way by Pastor Keon's father. And what seems so interesting to me is if you listen to Pastor Keon tell the story about the timeline of his mother's divorce, he specifically says, quote, it's you, me, and the girls, end quote. And I take this to mean that when his mother is going through the divorce, he and his younger sister have already been conceived with the pastor of the church, his father, Reverend Cato Brooks Jr. So is Pastor Keon saying that his mother was also married when her relations with the married pastor of the church took place? And if this is true, what negative things would Pastor Keon expect his mother to say about these men? And technically, if all of this is true, all three of these children were really children born of the marriage. But in my mind, it seems that her husband would agree in the divorce proceedings to pay child support for Pastor Keon's older sister if he believed that child was his biological daughter. So this is very confusing to me. Pastor Keon is saying he sees the two garbage bags and at that time, his two sisters are also born and living in the home at the time the divorce takes place. So if Pastor Keon and his younger sister are fathered by the pastor of the church and the divorce has not yet occurred, in a technical legal sense, all three of the children were born of the marriage. And so just picture the fact that Pastor Keon's mother is married to a man while all of this is going on and somebody, either Pastor Keon's mother or what he calls his stepfather, wants a divorce. And I'll let you decide which one of them you think wanted that divorce. But I am perplexed by Pastor Keon being so shocked that his mother didn't have anything bad to say. And I thought it was interesting that she seemed to think that she could sue the man for child support when they went through a divorce when she could have asked the judge for child support for Keon's older sister. But I guess she probably would have been scared that the man would have raised the issue of the other two children that were born during the time of the marriage and conceived with another married man who was the pastor of the neighborhood church. And so Pastor Keon says to his mother, quote, you never said that he left us, end quote. I mean, I'm astonished by the fact that, quote unquote, the real truth that he thinks his mother protected him from was the general fact that his stepfather just left them. But it almost seems that he's still oblivious to the fact that the man left because his wife had two whole children with another married man while he was married to Pastor Keon's mother. And so, it seems clear to me that when she says, quote, when you make decisions, you have to learn to live with them, end quote. She knows that if she takes either of the men to court for child support, the next thing that would come would be the paternity test. And clearly, she did not want to demolish the church because I bet her husband knew that the pastor of the church, Cato Brooks Jr., was the father of those two other children. But the story is not over. 
And so after doing everything she could do to deal with circumstances, she knows she set in motion. Let's find out what else Mother Henderson said happened. How I, I manage with three, having three of my own, and taking then care of everybody did, else's. taking care of everyone else, kid, child, their mom, they fell out with their parents. All I can say it was done by the grace of God because of what I was bringing in, it was no way. Taking care of five or taking six kids. Taking care of those many children. Because many people have folded up under that. Yeah. You know, and everything. So I had to trust in him. Because that's all, all I knew. That's all I had. Yeah. You know. And I, I, I wasn't going to destroy the church. You know, that was the farthest thing away from my mind. Before I had done that, I would rather have walked away. Wow. Yeah. So, and I believe because I was obedient and listened to his word, that's why he kept us. You know, even though it, it angered you more so than it did the girls, you know in uh, the living conditions that we, and the things that we had to go through, it angers you more so than any of them. You know, you never really express that, you know, you never really verbally said anything to me, but it was in your demeanor. And the book, The Shift, allowed me and to see the real you when you was growing up in that condition. <laughs> and I, 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 I end up seeing it from a whole new, different perspective because those was your words that you did not express when you was growing up. I don't know because it was out of respect or, or what, well, I used to go to granddaddy and complain, and he would say to me, and you know how he talked, ain't nothing she could do about it. It is what it is, and you just need to get over it, and you just need to, <laughs> you need to live with it. And he would say, and you can come around here as much as you want to. That's why I used to go to Grandma Erlene and Grandma Irvin and granddaddy in them house so much. I was proud of you. I just hate it what we had to go through. And let me tell you why. Because I would look five blocks up the street and I would see our father in a five bedroom house driving nice cars, five blocks down the road, I'm looking at you. And I used to wonder, why won't he help her? Why won't he do something? I never asked him. Um, I never questioned him but i did ask it internally i was mad i was i don't know if i ever got over it until i was in my 30s and so you can see and i'm almost convinced of this at this point that while pastor keon is angry about his father not helping his mother his mother is doing everything she can to cover it up because she knows that it would destroy the whole church if the truth came out and that everybody would want to blame her. But at the same time, it seems that Mother Henderson seemed to be completely oblivious to the fact that her child was so angry. And it seems that he couldn't talk to her, and it's clear that she didn't talk to him about it. Although it was one of the most important things in Pastor Keon's early life. And I just wonder why they didn't think they could talk to each other about it. Because she clearly says that she could see the anger in his demeanor. She could clearly see that he was angry, but now she is saying that he did not express it. And so for some reason, she seemed to think that he could have expressed it. And for some reason, Pastor Keon did not think that he could express what he was feeling to his mother.
And so I think some would say that it would have been easy for Pastor Keon's father to just slip the mother some cash on the down low. But maybe Pastor Keon's father thought that doing so would have been seen as evidence against him and it seems that he didn't want to create a paper trail. And so they're all trapped in this circular silence that has absolutely had a devastating effect on Pastor Keon's life and I believe the lives of all of these women he keeps marrying. In addition, it seems to have even haunted him. God, I, won't push out I can't stand face to face with you. Because every time I stand face to face to you, I feel what's going on in your belly. And I feel what God is doing down on the inside. Down on the inside, I sense the Holy Spirit doing something. Hallelujah. There's a transformative process going on down in your belly, in your spirit. And this ain't, this ain't going to come off soon. This is going to go with you. This is going to be in the car with you. This is going to be in that secret place you go to pray. That secret place you go to pray. That secret place. Where you go to really wail before God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. God said you got a place you go. You never told me that, but God said you got a place you go. When you are overwhelmed, there's somewhere, there's some spot that you go. When you go back, ah, God said, when you go back to that place. Yee, shandu, it'll, 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 many things you told me, you never told me you had a place. But the Holy Ghost said, you got this spot that you go to. When it really gets tough. And God said, he's waiting for you in that place. There's a spot. He's filling you to the brim. He's filling you to the brim. To the brim. He's using the agony to bless you. <laughs> oh! Uh-huh. He's filling you. Uh-huh. Let it out. Let it out. Let it out. Don't be no tough guy. Let it out. 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 Uh, like that. Let it out. Let it. Let it out like that. Let it out like that. Let it out. Let it out. Let it out like that. Let it out. Let it out. Let it out like that. That's the spot where your water turns to wine. When you let it out. When you let it out. When you let it out. Let go of your cute stuff and let it out. The Bible says you have many teachers, but not many fathers. There is a difference in the sound of a father than a teacher. I do not come to you, I do not come to you as a teacher. I come to you as a father. I come to you as a father. I see something in you you don't see in yourself. Mm -hmm. I see something in you you don't see in yourself and you're tired and you're tired and you can't even tell nobody you're tired you're tired I'm not talking about you need sleep you're tired but the Lord said he's going to renew your strength you never told me you were tired but the Holy Ghost said you're tired your spirit is tired. You mean you gonna watch your pastor get a breakthrough and you're not going in? You mean your leader going in and you're not going in? Where are you? Zion, where are you? You don't get so anointed you don't need a father. You don't get so gifted you don't need a father. You need somebody who can lay hands on you. I don't care. I don't care how many churches you got. I don't care how many titles you got. I don't care how much money you make. 
<laughs> now, I already know all of the comments that y'all gonna be writing in the comment section. And I ain't got nothing to do with all of that power bottom, oh, I mean, rigmarole that y'all be talking about in these comments. <laughs> Cause I need to stay focused on the matter at hand, honey child. Now, one of the things that I have heard from many of you surrounds the issue of the amount of anger that Pastor Keon was carrying around against his father, as well as the amount of anger that he must have been carrying around against his mother. And I really couldn't understand that because all the man talks about is his damn mama all of the time. But it seems that maybe there was some sort of emotion building up inside of Pastor Keon resulting from this enormous trauma that he had endured. I was mad yeah, for a long, very for a long, long time. time. And like I say, even the, the anger that you had toward him it also kind of spills over toward me right. as well, you know. But like I said, you, you never verbally expressed it, but it was all in your facial expression, you know, and, your, and everything. I can see it, I can feel it and everything. But I still had to stand the ground in which I promised the Lord. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because uh, I knew that one day you was going to be where you are today. Because, like I say, even though he, wa your father wasn't there in the house personally, he would always tempt that you, that you were going to be great. God had something great for you to do. That you was going to be, out of all the sun, the best preacher. And that you was going to be able to reach people. That was your calling on your life. Why it happened the way it happened, I have I no know. idea. Nobody yeah. know. Nobody know. I was, uh... But he predicted your life before you can see and after you can see and did it to me and let no. me say right here in your face on camera in the year 2020 and i said this to him before um i saw him alive for the first time uh, uh alive for the last time my anger was because i didn't have any other emotion to access it was the only one i knew um I didn't know how to communicate it. I just wanted something more. And I wanted what I thought he had for us. I looked at new suits, new clothes, new cars, family vacations, family reunions. And I only knew seven or eight of my family members total, including both sides. I wanted it for you. I wanted it for us. Wow. Now, I'm completely blown away by her mindset, and I kind of feel like she thought she was on a mission assigned by God, and that is how she rationalized all of this. I mean, in her mind, was this God's plan? But when you listen to what she's saying, I feel like maybe she's being told all of this by Pastor Keon's father, and it's being used in some kind of way as a manipulation mechanism. I mean, let me know in the comments if you see it the same way or if you have another possible explanation for this mindset. And Pastor Keon seems to think that he's overcome his anger, but has he? We just got a few years left with you. Your parents are leaving. Not just your natural parents, your spiritual parents. Our knees are buckling. These moments are precious. 
they will write about these moments. These moments define you. You get your name from your daddy. A bitter woman called him Benoni, but the old man called him Benjamin. And Benjamin was the name that stuck. Oh! God's getting ready to put his name on you. Some of you never had a father to really lay their hands on you and deal with you. But God's getting ready to give you a fresh name and a fresh release. And an impartation on your life. An impartation. This is real stuff. This is real stuff. I don't want to go nowhere else. I don't need no place to preach. I don't want no place to preach. All I need is a destiny moment. I want to go where it's real. Or leave me at home. I like my house. Leave me in my house. I only come out when God's going to do something. Hey! Tonight God is doing something. Tonight God is doing something. Tonight God is doing something. I don't know what's going on over in that corner, but somebody got something over in that corner. It's a breakthrough coming in your spirit and in your life. This is a real deal. This is not church as usual. This is church unusual. Something just settled in your spirit. Something just settled in your spirit. It's going to take you weeks to see all the details, but something supernatural got in your belly tonight. You'll never be the same again. I got to stop. I got to stop. I got to stop. I feel it. I feel it. God is doing some stuff in this room. God is doing some stuff in this room. God is doing some stuff. He's getting you ready. This is a destiny moment. So they took 30 gallons of water. They poured it into six pots. Three is the number of the Trinity. Six is the number of man. God's going to get down in you 30 times 6 180 you've been saying you're going to make a 360 but a 360 brings you back to where you were tonight for some family this was a 180 this was a 180 well for this family, Bishop, it was not just a 180, it was a complete 360 because eight months after this event, Pastor Keon filed for divorce and served Lady Felicia with his divorce petition. And I don't really think that he has dealt with all of his demons because he does not seem to want to be fully advised of his mother's role in the reason why he is suffering so much agony. I think his mother accepts her role in it but I don't think Pastor Keon accepts her role in it at all. But much of what he had suffered resulted from decisions that his mother made. He thinks he's indebted to her for the role she played in the absence of the stepfather that left and the biological father that never came. But the stepfather left because of Mother Henderson's decision to be involved with the married pastor of the church. And the married pastor of the church could never publicly acknowledge Pastor Keon as his son because he was married and because he was the pastor of the church. He did not want to acknowledge his relationship with a married woman. In addition, Pastor Keon's mother did not want to do anything that resulted in her actions being the blame for the collapse of the entire church. And so, Although being publicly acknowledged as his father's biological son was something that Pastor Keon desired the most, it was something that could never come to pass. And I don't believe he has really ever been able to resolve it. And I really think it is compounded when you think about how decisions his mother made created the dilemma. And so I ask you again, ladies and gentlemen of this church house jury, do you believe Pastor Keon's inability 
to ever realize public acknowledgement from his father that he was his biological son is a painful thirst that cannot be satisfied by any relationship with any woman, including Shani. And until Pastor Keon ever finds the way to reconcile his mother's role in the ordeal that he suffered to her face rather than writing it in books, do you think Pastor Keon will ever find any woman who will ever be able to live up to the standard that he has created of his mother? Please let me know what you think by leaving your comments in the comments section below. And I hope you'll also give me a big thumbs up. And I hope you'll also consider donating to this video and my entire channel ministry by donating to the Professor Blackmore dot com cash app and i hope you'll also subscribe to my youtube channel and click the bell so you'll be notified whenever i come back with more hot tea on this reality show hot mess drama and please also follow me on tiktok and instagram